is not going to be very long. This is, uh, and this is not a war story. It's basically just giving you some principles with regard to, in regard to four-wheel drive and transfer cases. And to begin with, um, any of you guys ever put a vehicle in four-wheel drive and drive on the pavement? Yeah. What happens? Yeah. It also causes, actually, you have something called drive line lined up. Everything is really tight. You take a four-wheel drive, if you put different size tires on the front and the back or on one part of a four-wheel drive, it causes problems. So you really don't need to do that. All the tires need to be the same. The differential in the front and the rear needs to be the same. Okay, all of them needs to be the same. And so if you're on, uh, you actually also need to be, when you're in a, uh, put it in a four-wheel drive, you need to be where the tires can slip and, you know, unless it's full-time four-wheel drive, and that is a different setup, and we'll talk a little bit about that in it too. Um, but this transfer case, now he's going to get a, a charge out of this transfer case business because you guys fought that transfer case last week. Remember that? So you're going to recognize some of the parts you're seeing in here. Part-time transfer case system may be manually shifted, electronically shifted, or automatically shifted. The one on the Bronco has got a knob. Uh, Two-wheel high, four-wheel high, four-wheel low. Simple as that. How do you get four-wheel low out of a transfer case? What do you do in there? You guys saw it. Remember? You're in the headlights. How do you typically multiply torque? What are you doing in an automatic transmission? At a gear. You're doing, and you have a gear set that is called a gear reduction. planetary gear set. Well, gear reduction basically is what you're getting, but you're using a planetary gear set to get there, uh, and that kind of thing. So, um, now vehicles with part-time transfer cases operate the same as two-wheel drive vehicles, but four-wheel drive is not engaged. So if you don't have it in four-wheel drive, you're just driving a two-wheel drive car. Now I have seen situations where something was wrong with the drive shaft or, you know, going back to the rear end and all, and they couldn't, you know, didn't have a drive shaft for it. And you could put it in four-wheel drive and just drive it with the two front wheels. I mean, that's doable, you know, if you decide you want to do that. Uh, it's only operated in four-wheel drive mode with companion by the driver in the case of the automatic four-wheel drive system. You ever heard of that? Automatic four-wheel drive? On these vans, uh, back first time I ever saw that was Ford had these, uh, these vans that were uh, Aerostar vans, and some of them had automatic four-wheel drive. They have a transfer case, they had sensors looking at the front and the rear, and if it saw that the wheels in the back were spinning, there was a little module under the seat. You didn't even have any control over it. A little module under the seat to automatically put it in four-wheel drive. That's how the and, Ford on the Huh? That's yeah. how the Ford on the Yeah, the Ford on the yeah, okay. All right, and so uh, now full-time transfer case systems are always in the four-wheel drive mode and cannot be controlled by the driver. Of course, the automatic ones really the ones I saw couldn't either, or some of them probably. The front drive line is always engaged and remains constant power, both front and rear axles. <coughs> now, well, the way that the, a lot of these axles uh, work nowadays are like, uh, you know, some of the older Jeeps. The way that they would do it, they had a, uh, uh, your stub axle going out to your wheel, and then they had one coming out of the front differential, and they would have a splines on these two stub axles that are up against each other. But the only time they were ever engaged was when this collar slid over those splines and it locked those axles together. So that's how your vacuum hub lock works. And somewhere around here, I've got a, one of those, you know, that I like to show. And I was going to bring it in here and I was back there looking. It must be over there in the other shop or something, but I couldn't find it. But it's not that hard to understand. Basically, you've got a shift fork that just moves over and locks the axles together and then it moves and unlocks them. And the, and the Bronco's got knobs you got to turn. So you got to get out, lock your hub, doesn't drag. And you know you're not going to like that. Mm -hmm. I know one guy, uh, his son got killed that way. He got out and he was locking the hubs and the, the thing rolled over on him while he was out there locking the hubs. They, it, it was sliding a little bit. And he just kind of took a chance, you know. But uh, full time transfer case has a center differential or inner axle differential between the front and rear output shafts. And it's got a full time, it's got a, it won't perform like a two wheel drive vehicle, but if you get an all wheel drive car, uh, you know, they stick to the road like glue. They, they drive so much better than a two-wheel drive car, particularly in curves and stuff. Now here's your transfer case right here. Does this look familiar to you guys? It does, doesn't it? You've seen this before, right? It uses a large chain to transfer power from the front output shaft. Now your, uh, a lot of your front-wheel drive transmissions on the GM cars and stuff, 4T60E and all that, they got a big old chain like that too. 
Now, not every front wheel drive transmission has got a chain. Some of them just use gears. So in this particular one, you got a, the one that we're looking at, the way the design we're looking at is the chain. All right, so basically you got your reduction hub there. You got an inner lockup hub, a drive sprocket here, a lockup collar. This will be clearer to you when you tear the transfer case down. You'll be seeing this stuff in there and you'll understand what you're looking at. And uh, that's a fun job, isn't it? Did y'all enjoy tearing it down? Uh, one of the things you learn when you throw that transfer case down is it's got an oil pump in it. So it keeps it lubricated like that. Okay, so you got a driven sprocket going to the front output shaft. There's your little clutch housing here. And there's your drive sprocket. Okay, so you got an input shaft. You got, that's the sun gear on your planetary. And there's your reduction hub. Then your rear output shaft. See this collar right here? And you see this shift fork. It kind of looks like a manual transmission part, doesn't it? When it's in two wheel high, the reduction hub slides forward and engages its internal splines with the external splines at the end of the input shaft. Click does that. Like that. Can you slide forward? Anybody miss that? Anybody miss that? See what happened? You got that? This is going to your rear, and this one here goes to your front. Right? That's two wheel drive high. Now you can put the transfer case in neutral. If you don't put the transfer case in neutral, now have anybody ever run into a problem pulling a vehicle behind another vehicle down the road? You've done that, right? You drag them down the road. What happens if you drag one a long way with the drive shaft in it? Destroys the transmission. You know why? Not any lubrication going on back there. So if you're going, like if your buddy's going to have to have his, you know, have you drive, drag his vehicle to Panama City or something, uh, put it up on a car hauler so that the wheels that are hooked to the, you know, and drive it that way. Like if it's a front wheel drive car, it's best to roll it up on a little U-Haul car hauler thing uh, or jack it up, the jack the front of it up or, you know, put it on roll back, whatever. But if you're just driving it, if you're dragging it, I mean, I've actually seen, you can usually drive them drag them maybe 15, 20 miles, uh, but they're going to start heating up and there's a possibility for damage, so you need to be thinking about that. You know? uh, but I mean, the, the, a lot of people, if they're going to drive it from here to Kinston or somewhere, they'll take a drive shaft out because they're afraid you're going to tear the transmission. you got to think about what's at stake, that's basically. But on the, the four-wheel drive ones, some of them, you can put it in neutral so that it doesn't, you know, so when you're driving it, the drive shaft is not driving the transmission, it's actually just spinning free in here. And two wheel high basically takes it out of neutral and puts it in two wheel high. Now the four wheel drive components are engaged. At this time, the splines of the reduction hub and input shaft become butted and they prevent engagement. The helical spring at the base of the shaft will maintain shift pressure, so that makes it go ahead and snap in as soon as those line up. You ever try to put a manual transmission car in reverse and it won't go in until you let off a clutch and then it drops in place? That's what they're talking about. Uh, that allows the components to engage once the shaft rotates. When the vehicle is putting gear torque is transmitted to the transfer case input shaft from the transmission output shaft. And there you go, that's not complicated, it's four wheel high. But let's see what happened here. See that? Two wheel high. All right, you see what happened there. All right. Now then, there's four wheel high. See, you're getting this all the way through. Uh, the reduction hub connects the input shaft to the rear output shaft, torque transmitted to the rear axle. I like to tell this story one time. This guy had a uh, uh, this transmission mechanic. I've talked about this a few times in here. Some people might remember it if they watched a lot of YouTube videos. And he had this uh, Ford truck. It was four wheel drive. And he was a transmission mechanic. And it was, uh, it came in, and the write up was that it would shift through all of its gears before he even got going 25 miles an hour. First, second, third, it would go all the way into high gear. And he's scratching his head, trying to figure it out, and pressure test and all this stuff. Dude didn't see anything. Figured he'd go in there and throw clutches and seals and then look at the valve body and all. Did all of that, put it back together, and it was nothing changed. And so he scratched his head, and he was trying to figure it out. You know, of course, um, they called me over there. I wasn't even doing transmissions at the time. Uh, but I looked in there on the dash in the four-wheel drive light. When you put it in four-wheel drive, you know the four-wheel drive light comes on? The four-wheel drive light when I was playing with it, I noticed four wheel drive light wouldn't work. And I saw that there was a problem with the 
the fuse that was feeding all the little warning lights, as I remember some. And so when we put a fuse in there and the four wheel drive light started working, it went through the gear normally. And the reason the four wheel drive light causes that is because the PCM looks at the power coming through the four wheel drive light. And if it sees that power, which you know is a switch on the transfer case that turns it on, if it sees power on the four wheel drive light, it's looking at that line, it assumes that it's in two wheel, you know, or in high, four wheel high or two wheel high. But whenever that power goes away, the four wheel low, actually not four wheel drive light, four wheel low is what it was. And the four wheel low light wasn't working and the PCM says, well, we're in four wheel low. And so it was, had a different shift strategy for, for that. And so whenever we put a fuse in there and it shifted through the gears, that job was done. You know. But the thing about this, he, was, he, he didn't see the forest for the trees. I mean, that was something that the, if he looked at the wiring schematic, who's thinking about looking at a wiring schematic when you got one shifting out sooner, you know, and figuring something out like that. It's tricky. Uh, the reduction up connects the input shaft to the rear hubs. You have torque trim in the rear axle. But you're also getting this now, you know, when that puts back. Now you're getting this spinning going that way and you're going that way too. Uh, when it's selected, the lockup collar moves and locks the inner lockup hub in the drive sprocket. Not too complicated. And the inner lockup hub lock the drive sprocket, the drive sprocket lock the rear output shaft. So you're basically putting all this together. So you're turning that and the chain's turning this. Fairly simple. And one of the reasons I do this is when you tear the transfer case down, you'll understand a lot better what you're looking at. Uh, when low is selected, the reduction hub moves uh, into the planetary carrier, and that locks the planetary uh, carrier to the rear output shaft. And so your planetary carrier, basically you're going to turn it a lot going in, but the planetary carrier is going to turn it not as much going out, so you're, you're actually got a lower gear in that way. Uh, when it's uh, put in gear, the torque's routed through the planetary pinion gears. The planetary pinion gear walk around the inside of the ring gear, makes the planetary carrier rear output shaft rotate uh, in a reduction. In other words, slower. You're turning a lot here, not much back there, and that gives you more power. Uh, that allows more torque to be transferred uh, to the transfer case. So, you now, and then a, a four wheel high position, the inner lockup hub remains locked to the drive pocket. So, it, you want it to be, you know, there's not really a two wheel low. You got four wheel low, four wheel high neutral, and two wheel on these kinds. All right, the inner lockup hub locked to the drive pocket. Torque's also transmitted front differential through the drive train, driven pocket, front output. Yeah. This is just a bunch of words, but you can kind of, I basically, the visuals was what I was liking here. Now, Electronic controls, engagement, disengagement, and transfer gear selections, uh, clutch coil operation if equipped. A clutch coil is kind of like an air conditioner clutch in there that enables it to shift on the fly. You know, the ones that shift on the fly, we push a button on the dash and it goes into four-wheel drive when you're moving along. Uh, these other ones don't do that. Uh, vacuum regulator, solenoids on vehicles equipped with a vacuum hub lock system or a vacuum operated front axle. Um, on the Ford vehicles, the late model Fords, uh, there's a vacuum hub lock in there. And when you take the, the crazy thing to me is, on those, when you remove the vacuum from the hubs, they lock. And when you put vacuum on them, they unlock. Remember that? Didn't you change one of those last semester or something? Yeah. And yeah, we were working on one over there that had those uh, hub locks on it and that thing. But the hub lock is way out there on the outer, outer edge. And Beatty was here, and he actually, there's a little bitty, you know, it's like a CV axle goes in there, but it's a little teeny tiny nut on there, it's like 13 millimeter. <laughs> and it's real easy if you're not careful to bust it off, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, one way or another, uh, here's your mechanical components right here. This is the transfer case, and there's the inner parts. Well, you can see the planetary gear set parts. They don't, they're not even picturing the planetary gears here. They're just showing you the carrier and the uh, sun gear. And there's your little gears, and of course you got the, uh, excuse me, the ring gear, not the sun gear. That's the sun gear, that's the ring gear, that's the planet gear. Goes down in there. Uh, simple planetary gear set for dork multiplication. And they walk around the inside. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But it's attached directly to the output shaft through the reduction hub. The output shaft rotates the lower speed than the input shaft. You know, you can see how all that works. You know, if you can understand it better when you get the transfer case apart, why don't you look into that when you do that. Uh, that increases the torque available to the wheels. Right. Now, you got your chains. See that chain, how it's put in there? All right, the transfer case contains a high efficiency drive chain. What's that look like to you? It looks like an old timing chain, except it's bigger. Right. And so, you got these clutches. Now, this is the part where it, it departs from what we've been looking at so far. You see that AC clutch? 
it basically pinches these together. You notice this has got splines on the outside and these other ones got splines on the inside. And when you pinch those together, all that becomes one unit. And that's your shift on the fly. Now when a shift on the fly first came out, they had a module down in there on the deck. And sometimes they give trouble. They have transfer case shift motor down here too. But and those particular ones didn't have the clutch there for the shift on the fly, but they did have it where when you click four wheel drive, that shift motor would turn the inside of the you know the transfer case. And you can pull that shift motor off and look on that transfer case and you'll see the place where it'll say too high, too low, and all this. And you can actually, if you have to, you can take the shift motor off, get under the truck, and get some you know pliers and turn that thing and put it in four wheel drive if you find yourself in a bind. Of course if the mud's all the way up to the rocker panel, you're gonna have issues with that. You know? uh, but the simple fact is they had two relays in there that would go don't, 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 which was really interesting to me. The shift motor is almost like a glorified windshield wiper motor because it's got contacts in there. It's like, as a matter of fact, I got one up there somewhere that I've got on a board uh, that I had fixed up where you could wire it up and you could drive it. You can see LEDs come on where the, you know, the different plates in there would move around and the, the module has got to know where it's at. All right, transfer case clutch. It's a nice colorful picture, isn't it? You see that uh, clutch right there? It's obviously grounded to the case. When you energize it, it, energize, it squeezes those clutches and all of this becomes one, see? When it's applied. That's not too complicated. All right. In automatic four-wheel drive, the module uses the torque on demand relay to activate the clutch pull at a higher duty cycle when it senses a difference in the front output shaft speed and the rear output shaft speed, and that eliminates slip. When slip, talking about tire slip. But it's going to be slipping those clutches in there a little bit. Uh, returns to the normal lower duty cycle when those good conditions are present. So it only uses four wheel drive when it needs to. That saves gas and everything else. Um, and so the clutch coil is also increased under heavy throttle and off throttle conditions at vehicle speeds above uh, 30 miles an hour. This is kind of what that looks like. You, know, you got your electronic four wheel drive module, rear axle speed sensor, front axle speed sensor, transfer case clutch solenoid. And there's your electronic four wheel drive indicator I was talking about. You know, obviously. Now, usually on the ones that aren't shift on the fly, you've got to have it in neutral before you can put it in, you know, change gear and all that. The viscous coupling, this is where the rubber meets the road. Actually, no, the rubber meets the road where the tires are. But on this particular one, I, the closest thing I can tell you that a viscous coupling is like one of these. Seen that before? What is that? You guys know what this is. This is embarrassing. What is this? Looks like a, something that goes in a flywheel in here. Some of you guys have changed these out. This is a fan clutch. It is? Yeah, that's all it is. It's not the, a fan on it. What changes that one? You see that little spiral spring? Now, that is a bimetal spring, and when heat's coming through the radiator, it causes that bimetal spring to change on the inside, and it makes this have more resistance. This particular one uh, came off of a little pickup truck that was uh, air conditioner would start, the head pressure would start going up, going up, going up and start, you know, causing slipping the belt and all. And this fan clutch was no good. And when we put a fan in front of the radiator going through the condenser, it stopped all of that noise. Uh, but this particular one I pulled off there, it's easy to hold in my hand. I got a bigger one down there, it's aggravating to hold up. Um, the, that one up there, you see the one with the wires connected to it? That came off a trailblazer and the PCM actually decides how viscous that coupling is so that it can change the speeds, the speeds of the fan. That's an expensive part, but at the same time, if you act, you can actually go in there with your scan tool and command that fan to get, you know, percentages faster and all that stuff. But the point is the viscous coupling is there because whenever you, it doesn't have drive line wind up because it, it actually is transmitting torque, but it also allows for slippage. That makes sense. That's what the viscous coupling is about. I want to make sure that everybody got that. All right. Full time four wheel drive vehicles. Uh, it's similar to a limited slip differential. Got a little bit more pressure than that thing. Limited slip differential has got little clutch plates in there, you know, going to the axle so that both wheels will turn at the same time. My wife's pickup truck is a 2016 F-150. And if she's spinning in the wet grass, there's a knob on the dash you turn and you know, suddenly you have positive traction. <laughs> Whenever you, you turn it, you, you select it when you need it, and you turn it off when you're done. 
Um, so regardless of the traction available with the tires, it performs its approved vehicle traction with the rotation speed of the front rear wheel bearing. Now, it's similar to multi-disc clutches used in automatic transmissions. See how it pinches those together? It has a seal housing, it has two sets of discs. Uh, unlike the disc, it's basically, you know, uh, the, the, the fluid is real thick and it has to cut through it, uh, which is really what we don't want our motor oil to have to do, you know. You know, this one guy that's showing the difference between ketchup and mayonnaise. You know, if you got a higher viscosity oil and you're trying to stir mayonnaise, you know how aggravating that is? And you can stir ketchup real easy, you know, that's the difference in your viscosity. But that's what that is. They got a ferric natural carburized coating. One set of discs is connected to the coupling housing, which is connected to the plantar gear ring, and the other set's connected to the internal hub of the coupling. So basically, some's connected in here, some's connected out here. That's what they're talking about. All right, the drive plates are held in a fixed position. To the housing can't move either horizontally or vertically, and the driven plates are splined to the inner hub, and it's, it's having to cut through all this stuff here, see? So splined to the inner hub lets the driven plates float horizontally, so when extreme pressure builds up, they can slide along and be forced against the drive plates. You know, there's various different designs of this, they don't all work exactly the same, but you get the point. It lets it slip. Direct mechanical coupling and maximum power at all wheels, and it allows the vehicle to get the needed traction uh, and free itself within a reasonable period, no harm done. If the driver continues to try to free it and is abusive, these may become warped and the coupling may fail. You know when you're rocking it back and forth trying to get out of the bog? That makes sense? In the slideshow. All right. Now, what about that one? You get that? You get anything there? Now, like I say, once again, when you're tearing the transfer cases apart, you're going to understand a little better what you're looking at when you get in there. And a transfer case is not like an automatic transmission, it's, you know, but you got to be able to put it back together where it's going to work right. Now, I've got one over there that's got the shift motor on it, that you can tear down. And then I've got this one over here that uh, off the, uh, the Dodge that these guys tore down. And uh, I thought it was going to do them in before they were done, but they finally got it back together. Whoever put it back together previously didn't put it back together, back together right and left the part out. And that was part of the problem we were having, you know, so. Somebody out there must do it. Yeah.